Good evening. Of all the questions we'd like answered, I think probably number one on the list is, how did the universe begin? And how will it end, if indeed it'll end at all? We know that our sun is one of a hundred thousand million stars in our star system or galaxy. And all those stars are themselves suns. But that's the end of the start. Far away in space, we can see other galaxies. For a moment, let's go back to our old friend, Ursa Major, the great bear. Follow on the bear's tail, past the lovely orange star Arcturus, and then to the constellation of Virgo with the bright star Spica, dominated at the moment, of course, by the presence of the planet Jupiter. And look there at the bowl of Virgo. Inside that bowl, there's a whole cluster of galaxies, and those are themselves huge star systems, many of them larger than our own Milky Way. And the largest of all is one called Messier 87. There it is, a huge elliptical system, very much larger than our own. But that is only 50 million light years away. And cosmically, that's not really so very far, because we can see objects far more remote than that. Look, for example, at this quasar. This, of course, is a negative picture, a black on white, and there, indicated by the arrow bars, you see that dot. And that is something like 13,000 million light years away. So we're seeing it, as it used to be, 13,000 million years ago. And that, of course, is long before either the Sun or the Earth came into existence. So the universe is a very large place indeed. Also, we know that beyond our own particular local group, all the galaxies and the quasars are racing away from us at tremendous speeds, sometimes more than 90% that of light. And don't forget, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So the entire universe is expanding. Well, now let's come back to our question. Most people, I think, these days believe that the universe, as we know it, came into existence at one moment in a big bang, sometime between 15,000 million and 20,000 million years ago. Now, that takes some crediting. I am not a cosmologist, uh, Ian Nicholson is. Welcome back to the sky at night, Ian. Ian, what was the Big Bang? Well, basically, it was a hot, dense, explosive event in which space, time and matter were created. It wasn't like an ordinary explosion. Matter didn't suddenly erupt forth into a pre-existing empty space. But instead, space and time and matter were all created together, and space has been expanding ever since. A useful analogy to this is to think about the surface of a balloon and represent galaxies by dots on its skin. As we expand the balloon, each dot moves away from every other one, but no one dot can claim to be the center of the expansion. And we believe our own universe of galaxies is behaving in a very similar way, each galaxy moving away from every other one, but no one being able to claim it as the center of this expansion. So it really is much better to think of galaxies as being at rest in an expanding space rather than thinking of them, of them as rushing apart through empty space. Well, if the Big Bang happened something like 15,000 million years ago, what happened before that? Well, that's a question we tend naturally to ask. But of course, if time itself began with the Big Bang, then before the Big Bang, there was no time. So in a sense, the question has no meaning. <laughs> Very well. What happened immediately after the Big Bang? Well, immediately after the Big Bang, the universe was in an extremely hot, dense state. And we think that round about 10 to the power minus 43 seconds, that's zero fol followed by 42 zeros and a one, the temperature was probably as high as 10 to the power 32 degrees. That's one followed by 32 zeros. And at those sort of temperatures, well, amazing things were happening. Now, round about 10 to the power minus 35 seconds after the initial event, many cosmologists believe that the universe entered a phase of accelerating expansion called inflation. And what inflation did was to take each tiny volume of space and blow it up enormously. So it, a little bubble of space would expand to become perhaps 10 to the power 50 times bigger than it was before. And the entire observable universe that we see today, represented by the circle, is no more than a microscopic fraction of the whole. Now we can look at this thing in a graphical way as well. The rapid rise corresponding to inflation and then at the end of inflation, about 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the beginning of time, the expansion slowed down and reverted to its gently decelerating expansion phase, which is where we live now. Well, yeah, that's all very well, but um, what caused the inflation? We think that in the universe today, the behavior of matter and radiation is controlled by four separate forces, the strong and the weak nuclear interactions, the electromagnetic force, and gravitation. But we believe that as you go to higher and higher energies, these forces begin to merge together, and that at high enough temperature, at least three of them, according to grand unified theory, or GUT, 
unite into a single grand unified force. And maybe at even higher temperatures, all four forces are united. So if the universe began with a single force, then as it expanded and cooled, the uh, strong nuclear force would separate off from the gut force. And that corresponded to a tremendous change in the state of the universe. While that change was taking place, until it was complete, the vacuum of space was filled with a tremendous amount of energy. And that acted rather like uh, negative gravity, like repulsion, to cause space to stretch in an accelerating way until the transition was complete. Once the transition was complete, then the expansion reverted to a gently decelerating rate and the energy that was in the vacuum was converted into a myriad of exotic particles. Well, the early universe must have been a very unfamiliar place from our point of view. It was extremely hot and energetic and filled with high energy photons, bits of light energy and particles and antiparticles. For every atomic particle, there exists an antiparticle which has opposite properties. And if two energetic photons, represented here by the squiggly lines, collide, they can produce a heavy particle, let's call it B, and its antiparticle B minus. Mm -hmm. And then if particles like those collide, they annihilate each other and turn back into radiation again. Less energetic photons produce lighter particles like electrons and positrons. And they too, when they collide with each other, turn back into radiation. Now all of this was going on at a furious rate, matter turning into energy, energy turning into matter. But as the universe expanded and continued to cool, the photons became insufficiently energetic to produce particles anymore. Now had there been an exact balance between the number of particles and antiparticles, then there would have been complete annihilation. There would have been no matter, no galaxies, stars, planets, and I fear no sky at night. Quite so. But Fortunately, there was a slight imbalance by about one part in a billion. We believe that for every billion antiparticles, there was a billion and one particles. So when the annihilation began, the billion antiparticles annihilated with a billion particles, leaving a residue of just one part in a billion. And it's that one in a billion residue which makes up all the visible matter, the stars, the galaxies, and ourselves in the universe today. After ooh, 100 seconds or so, the temperature had dropped to a modest billion degrees. And at that sort of temperature, protons and neutrons, the basic building blocks of matter, began to unite into heavier nuclei. So a proton plus a neutron would make a nucleus of deuterium or heavy hydrogen. If the deuterium picked up another proton, it would turn into helium-3, a lightweight version of helium. If we add just another neutron to the helium-3, we end up with conventional helium, such as we find in the universe today. Now, because neutrons were a little bit heavier than protons, there were fewer of them. And so when this mopping up of neutrons was complete, we ended up with just about one helium nucleus for every 10 protons or hydrogen nuclei. And when we look around the universe today, we see that hydrogen nuclei outnumber helium by a factor of 10 to 1. And that's a very strong confirmation of the Big Bang idea. Well, a great deal seems to have happened in the first three minutes of the life of the universe. What came next? After that, the universe was a, an opaque soup of matter and radiation expanding and cooling. And photons, bits of light, could travel hardly any distance at all without bumping into fast-moving electrons and being bounced around. So really, space was opaque. But after ooh, some 300,000 years, the temperature had dropped to about 4,000 degrees. And there, a dramatic change occurred because it was then possible for atomic nuclei to capture electrons and make complete atoms, thereby mopping up all these uh, electrons and allowing photons to travel freely through space without bumping into anything. And therefore, these photons could travel the length and breadth of the universe, and space had become transparent. The radiation which was released at that time uh, has been expanded, stretched through the expanding volume of space, stretched, diluted, and cooled, to form microwave radiation uh, all over the, the universe. Then, of course, galaxies came into existence. Then, indeed, galaxies came into existence. But how they were formed, when they were formed, and what order they were formed, we simply don't know. Have you got any firm evidence? A very strong piece of evidence was the discovery in 1964 by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson at Bell Labs, using this horn-shaped radio antenna, of the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
What they found was a weak background of microwaves with a temperature just three degrees above absolute zero, which seemed to be smooth and uniform across the whole sky. And we believe that this indeed is the radiation left over from when space became transparent at the end of the Big Bang. But one problem with the microwave background is it does seem to be very smooth and uniform. There are no non-uniformities in it, even as big as one part in 10,000. Now, if galaxies exist, which clearly they do, then there must have been some clumpiness in matter round about the time even when the microwave background was released. And if matter was clumpy, that ought to be reflected in slight variations in temperature in different parts of the sky in the microwave background. Cosmologists, until about a year ago, were getting very anxious yes. about this because they couldn't find any trace of this. But back in April 1992, the COBE satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer, results from that satellite were released which show a map of the sky, showing indeed some clumpiness and blotchiness in the microwave background. And these clumps correspond to fractionally hotter and cooler bits of the sky. This particular map contains a lot of instrumental noise and local effects as well, but we're getting more and more convinced that embedded in the map are real effects, variations in temperature of only one part in 100,000, 30 millionths of a degree between different parts of the sky. But that's about the right sort of size. That's the sort of blotchiness we'd expect if galaxies and clusters were to form. However, there is a point about this. The temperature mm. variations are so small that it means the variations in the density of ordinary matter were very small. And if galaxies and clusters were to have formed by now, then there had to be a lot more ma mass present than we can see. And therefore, that implies that there is a, a great deal more dark matter than luminous matter in our universe. Well, if that's so, do you think the expansion is going to go on indefinitely? If we can measure the average density of matter in the universe, then we can determine whether the expansion is going to go on forever or not. If the density is precisely equal to something called the critical density, and that's only about three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter, if the density is exactly equal to the critical density, the universe is able to expand forever, but only just. If, on the other hand, the density is uh, somewhat less than the critical density, the expansion will go on forever, the universe is then said to be open. If the density is slightly greater than the critical density, gravity eventually will halt the expansion and lead to a collapse of the universe into a big crunch. Now, the mean density of matter divided by the critical density gives us something called omega. And if omega is greater than one, we live in a closed, collapsing universe. If omega is less than one, we live in an open, ever-expanding universe. And if omega is precisely equal to one, we live on a universe that's sitting on the fence between these possibilities. And such a universe is called a flat universe because, in a sense, space in that universe is infinite like a flat tabletop rather than being curved like the surface of a balloon. Well. How can we determine the mean density of matter in the universe? If we think that all the mass is luminous matter, like we see in galaxies, then there isn't nearly enough to stop the expansion. There's only about 1% of what's needed. But observations of the way that spiral galaxies rotate in their outer parts imply that to move as fast as they do, there has to be five or 10 times as much mass as we can see. And observations of clusters of galaxies, the way the individuals mill around inside the cluster, require perhaps 10, 50, or even 100 times as much dark matter as luminous matter to hold these clusters together. So there are certainly observational reasons for thinking that omega might be somewhere near one. But if the universe went through a phase of inflation, then omega has to be equal to one or indistinguishably close. The reason for this is that inflation, as we saw earlier, blows every tiny region of space up to such an enormous size that the whole observable universe that we see today is just a tiny region of a vast inflated bubble. And so space to us looks flat in much the same sort of way that if you look at a very small mm. part of the Earth's surface, it looks flat because you can't see the whole picture. Inflation also solves, solves another problem, something called the horizon problem. And that's again to do with the microwave background radiation, which looks, apart from Kobe's tiny ripples, just the same in all directions. Now, around every point in space, we can draw a horizon. And the radius of the horizon is the distance that light could have traveled since the beginning of time. When we look at microwave radiation coming from one 
region on, in the sky over on the left, then that radiation has been traveling through space for 15 billion years and has only just reached us. And when we look on the opposite side of the sky, microwave radiation from that region has also only just reached us. Now, we can see both of those regions. They are just inside our horizon, but neither of these blobs can see the other. Neither is inside the opposite one's horizon. If that's so, no influence can have traveled from one to the other, and yet both regions have the same temperature and look exactly the same. If no influence could have been communicated between them, how could these opposite regions of space look so identical? Inflation solves the problem because very early on, before inflation, a tiny region of space inside the horizon could have become smooth and uniform. Inflation would blow that region up to be vastly bigger than the present day horizon, shown by the white line here. And so the observable universe is expanding into a bubble of space which is already smooth and uniform, and that's why the microwave background is the way that it is. What about this strange dark matter? Well, dark matter, if it exists, if the universe is, uh, has omega equal to one, then at least 90 to 99% of all the mass in the universe has to be dark matter rather than luminous matter. And of that, about 90% has to be not the ordinary stuff of which atoms are made, but exotic elementary particles with names like axions, photinos, gravitinos, and wimps. If there is enough of it to close the universe, then is there going to be another Big Bang? If gravity can halt the expansion, then what's going to happen, gradually at first, the galaxies are going to begin to move together. And uh, they're going to move together and faster and faster. Eventually the galaxies will merge, stars will dissolve, atoms will dissolve, the, ele the elementary particles will break up into quarks, and the Big Crunch will correspond to a, a time-reversed version of the Big Bang. Now, some have speculated that the Big Bang, the Big Crunch, might reproduce the conditions of the Big Bang, and off we'd go into a new cycle, so we might live in a universe that's expanding and contracting like a concertina. But if that did happen, and it's only if, there's no guarantee that the conditions next time would be suitable for the existence of life. Well, Leon, let me now ask you the $64,000 question. If the Big Bang did happen, then what caused it? We don't really know but there might be a clue from something called quantum fluctuations. There is something called the uncertainty principle, which tells us that in each tiny little volume of space, over a very short interval of time, we can't really know how much energy is there. So there could be enough energy to make particles and antiparticles, as long as they vanish before we notice them. Now, if a system has zero energy, then it can exist forever. And if the universe is sitting on the fence, then it does have a total energy of zero. So it could have begun with a quantum fluctuation and could thereafter persist forever. I wonder. Ian, thank you very much. So I'm afraid we can't, in fact, give you the complete answer. We don't know quite when time began, but one thing I can tell you is the next month we're going to be back and I'll be talking about the Cambridge Cambridge Telescope. And meanwhile, don't forget, if you want the latest information, then dial our information line 0898 666 000. And so, until next month, good night.